This is my favorite moisturizer, this La Mer Soft Cream, um, to wear under my makeup. Ah! Ugh! And the physicist who's dead literally uses sound waves and sang to his cosmetics. We can't lie because we don't understand things. I am glad that she likes it under her makeup. I like it under my kitchen sink, as in, in the trash where it belongs. Did I say it? I said it. You don't have to spend $400 on a moisturizer. And I bet a lot of people don't realize that good old Nivea has the same base ingredients as La Mer. That ain't true. That's not true. This brand goes so deep you don't even understand. Welcome to BJ Investigates a show I just created and might never do again. So today's video is a little bit different than our usual topics. It has to do with a luxury skincare brand known as La Mer. La Mer is a luxury skincare brand founded by former aerospace physicist Max Huber sometime in the mid to late 1970s. The most famous product from the brand is the original moisturizer or moisturizing cream, and it is referred to as creme de la mer. Now, all these French words are really don't know maybe he was trying to sound bougie maybe he was trying to sound fancy his name is definitely german and he lived in the united states but la mer means the sea influencers specialists even dermatologists like board certified doctors have made videos on youtube and all across social media weighing in on whether or not the brand is worth it and the reason that they probably are doing that is because la mer is widely known as one of the most expensive moisturizers probably in the world and probably ever. So I'm gonna be reviewing La Mer from my perspective as a dermatologist. The legendary skincare line with a bizarre backstory that most people don't know. You've probably heard of La Mer before. Almost every single celebrity has one of their products in their extraordinarily expensive and well-lit bathrooms. The brand's marketers, who are constantly going off about the rejuvenating and luxurious benefits that their creams provide to the skin, or from me and my unceasing pontificate about why I think it's all a load of bullshit. Or should we say, seaweed plus Nivea cream. La Mer, for example, the La Mer <laughs> moisturizing cream, which gets a lot of attention from celebrities for some reason. Some people love it. $500 for a moisturizer that's almost identical to most moisturizers? It's not gonna do it for me. I recently realized that a lot of these specialists, experts, and gurus have really failed to mention some extremely important aspects of the ingredients and the formulation of this brand. And I had to put on my science coat and become an expert to tell y'all what they were missing because I have not been able to stop thinking about it. Now, just to get this out of the way, and I'm gonna say it a few times in this video, I am not here to tell anybody that a $400 moisturizer is worth it. First of all, that's not really for me to say. Like, do I wanna spend $400 on moisturizer? No, I don't. It's up to you if it's worth it or not. The reason I wanted to make this video is because in the analysis of whether or not it's worth it, all these experts and specialists seem to be not really paying attention to some pretty critical factors that I think need to be considered when you're determining whether something is worth it or not. Girl, the gloves gotta go too. I'm not here to talk about whether something's worth it. I'm here to talk about facts and science. And we'll get to the bottom at the end whether you think it's worth it or not, but let's get into it. So recently, I was on the Sephora.com getting some basic provisions, not sponsored, but I mean, hit me up if you want to sponsor. And I had a bunch of saved up points. You know, when you're on Sephora, any other account, Ulta, any of them, you get to like accumulate these points and then you can use the points for stuff. I never use my points for two reasons. One, it's it's usually stuff I ain't trying to put on my face or my body, first of all. And second of all, it never really seems worth it. It's like you have to spend $1 to get one point and it'll be like a little sample you could get for free for 500 points. Like I had to spend $500? No, I'm just gonna hoard them like a dragon sitting on my pile of gold. That's me with my Sephora.com points. <laughs> So I never really use the points, but this particular time there were deluxe samples of La Mer and you could use your points for La Mer. And I have always heard about La Mer. La Mer. La Mer. La Mer. I'm the famous creme de la mer. This is my favorite moisturizer, this La Mer soft cream um, to wear under my makeup. Ah, she spoke too soon. How can you go in with a $4 witch hazel bomb of wet and dryness to an overpriced $400 tub of seaweed and Nivea? Why? Again, I am glad that she likes it under her makeup. 
I like it under my kitchen sink, as in, in the trash where it belongs. Did I say it? I said it. Not everyone can afford a $400 tub of face cream crap that is basic petrolatum jelly, and they wanna show off that they can. Hey, hint, hint from your acne big sister. Spending $400 on a cream does not make you elite or celebrity status. In my personal opinion, makes you dumb. I've never purchased a La Mer product, you know, at that time. And so I was like, yeah, definitely getting that. I added them to the cart, waited two to three days, whatever it was, and I got them. And the deluxe sample was 0.1 ounce of the original creme de la mer. And it took me like maybe, maybe seven to nine days to use it. Like that still, I mean, it goes a long way, but it was, it was gone immediately. It was not enough to really see. But I did notice some good things happening to my face. So I was like, it's just, it's just not, scientifically speaking, just wasn't a long enough time to see. If you're like me, and you ever tried to research La Mer, specifically this moisturizer, anywhere on the internet, you were probably told that it wasn't worth the money, it was overhyped, there was other dupes that are exactly the same thing, it's just not worth it because it's easily dupable. I don't care if you wanna be bougie, do not waste your money on this toxic sludge. Does anybody actually buy La Mer? And if you do, why would you? It's literally $545 for this moisturizer that they claim can heal burns. I can name six other brands off the top of my head right now that deal with burn victims. Listen, I don't, I don't care. I don't, I don't think Le Mer is worth the money, period. Ever. I never will ever, ever, ever think Le Mer is worth the money. It's gonna do what it probably says, and that's it. But a lot of other skincare can do exactly what it says it's gonna do. That's what I was told. And to be honest, I believe people on the internet who don't do nothing but make skincare videos. And if they're talking about skincare, I believe them. That's just true, I do. And we're talking about trusted people. We're talking about people who don't do anything but make skincare videos. Estheticians, people who are board certified dermatologists. Maybe I'm really trusted them, but we'll get to that in a minute. Skincare specialists, estheticians, and even dermatologists have come out across all the social media platforms, basically basically dragging La Mer across the internet for being overpriced and overhyped and all of this stuff. And no other dupe has been recommended by these people so much as the original German formulation of the Nivea cream in the tin can. We're gonna find out if Nivea cream is a dupe for creme de la mer. When it comes to the actual moisturizers in these two products, the base ingredients are almost identical. Is Nivea a dupe for La Mer? As far as the moisturizer, absolutely, 100%. The US version of Nivea cream is absolutely a moisturizing dupe for Creme de La Mer. I'm going to compare Nivea cream and La Mer. La Mer is the goat expensive uh, Nivea. You could get at any drugstore. Nivea is supposedly comprised of the same ingredients as La Mer, except for a sea algae concentrate. It's always the same thing, it's the same thing. In particular, let's look at this mixed makeup review, which I'm particularly upset with her because I really trusted her. She said, quote, good old Nivea has the same base ingredients as La Mer. It's totally fine, especially if you have dry skin. And I bet a lot of people don't realize that good old Nivea has the same base ingredients as La Mer. That's ain't true that's not true same base ingredients all you have to do is take a glance a passing glance at the ingredients list to know that that's not true let's look at nivea ting the ingredients here list as the first ingredient aqua that means water good old hydrogen dioxide aqua that's water that's water okay first of all now let's look at la Mer's first ingredient y'all see that something about algae extract see that the same base ingredients is just simply untrue everybody knows the first ingredient listed on an ingredients list is the most abundant ingredient in the formulation. So in Nivea, the most abundant ingredient in the formulation, if they're following the rules of packaging, is water. In La Mer, the first ingredient is algae extract. Okay, so that's not the same base ingredients. I am not sitting here trying to tell y'all that algae extract makes it worth the money. And no matter how many disclaimers I make in this video, I know some of y'all Lemire haters are gonna be in the comments talking about how stupid it is. I'm not saying it's worth the money. I'm saying 
We can't lie because we don't understand things. Aqua and algae extract ain't the same damn thing. Just first of all, first, just out the gate. And they're always talking about the German formulation. So I came across this video by Susan Yara in which she compared the Nivea cream to the creme de la creme by La Mer. And she compared the Nivea cream from the US market. But she said that the ingredients were not the same for the European version of the same cream. So the European version of the Nivea cream actually has 21 ingredients in total. So that is four more ingredients than the Nivea cream from the US. So I went ahead and checked the American formulation, the Mexican formulation, and any other formulation across the internet that I could find. And never nowhere did I find algae extract. Not the first, not the last, not the middle. Nowhere in sight can you find algae extract in Nivea cream. Now, can Nivea cream work well? Sure. Can it be a good moisturizer? Sure. Is it more worth the money than La Mer? Perhaps. But it's not the same thing. A lot of people don't realize that good old Nivea has the same base ingredients as La Mer. And everybody talking about good old Nivea is the same base ingredients. No, it ain't. It's so easily disprovable. All you have to do is read the first damn thing in the list. If you put something in a glass of water over here, some gold, and you put a piece of in a glass of water over here. They might have the, ba the same base ingredients according to Mix Makeup. I don't want to put one of them on my face, girl. Would you recommend this for? <laughs> Maybe for your kind of knees, um, but I wouldn't put it on the face. It's totally fine. <laughs> yeah, one of them I don't want on my face be honest. Now I have in here a video of Bethany Frankel comparing Nivea and La Mer and she's not doing it right. Okay, so this is the La Mer side. So La Mer is a little bougie. You, you gotta put it on a certain kind of way. Creme de La Mer has its own application approach that we call the ritual. I'm gonna show you Natalia how to do this along with me by firstly giving you about a pea size amount of creme and we're just gonna very gently. You gotta heat the formula up. Warm this in between the fingertips. And press it into your skin. We're gonna very gently press it into the skin. We can start on the cheeks. We can go from the forehead to the chin, and then also press the formula into the neck as well. And again, there can be legitimate criticisms with that. It takes too long, maybe it's a gimmick, maybe whatever, whatever. But if you're not applying a product the way that the manufacturer recommends you apply it, I don't think it's fair to do a review on it and say, well, this is how I apply it. It's like, you're not doing it right. So I don't know. Then she has like a side-by-side -side of her husband. Like she put Nivea on one side, greasy as hell. And I can't put Nivea on my face or Vaseline. I cannot put it on my face. Within two days, that will be so congested. Blackheads, butt Bumps, Melia, I can't put none of that on my face. No Nivea on my face. I cannot put Nivea on my face. It's greasy. Then you can't put makeup on top of it. It's like a cold cream. I mean, maybe if you want to put it on at night. Again, maybe it has some benefits, but I have not had benefits from that. I've used it. I tried in the past to use Nivea. But Bethany Frankel has that greasy, shiny, oily mess on one side of her face. And La Mer on the other side, and she's like, which, which one would you go on a date with? To her husband. And he's like, well, this side looks more, you know, natural. And this side looks more, you can tell he wants to say greasy or like oily but he's like um glowy <laughs> like natural this side the left side looks like you don't really have that much product on and the right side looks like you have more product on like glowier this is glowier right it's like grease she has grease on her face some stuff you can put on your feet that maybe you shouldn't put on your face that's what i'll leave it at. and honestly la Mer might work on good on your feet too who knows i don't care about my feet that much no offense feet <laughs> Ooh, just thinking about putting that on my feet did it get hot in here this is putting aside all the other allegations of is it overhype, is it overpriced, is it too expensive, All that, just put that to the side for a moment. It isn't the same as Nivea. Let's just all agree, maybe some ingredients are the same, but it ain't the same. It ain't a dupe, it's just not. And we'll get more into it. Maybe it's overpriced and all that. That's not the point here today. It's, it's to inform you because the gurus and the experts and the specialists haven't done so. Other than people pushing this whole not worth the money stuff and the overhype messaging and it's the same as Nivea bullshit folklore folklore we'll call it folklore mythology there's another allegation that la Mer's inventor max huber was a snake oil salesman snake oil salesman has come to mean someone who is selling you a product that doesn't work or they're lying about a product or they're saying something's a miracle that's really not a miracle and i've seen it like when i was looking at youtube videos on you know comparing la Mer to nivea i've seen only a very few videos that seem to be actually fair. It seems like everyone goes into it with their mind made up that it's overhype and overpriced and they don't fully look into the facts of the situation. But even the people that are being fair and saying,
saying, look, maybe it's overpriced, but these are the real differences I've noticed between the two, whatever. There's people in the in the comments talking about La Mer is snake oil. That's not particularly how it really went down. So let's get into a little bit of the background. The story goes like this. Max Huber was a literal rocket scientist. It's up for debate whether he actually worked for NASA or whether he worked with NASA, but he was an aerospace physicist who got badly burned in a lab accident. His face was burned and he was trying to use the concoctions and the medications of the day to heal his face and he was not having the results that he wanted. So Max, a physicist, decided to take matters into his own hands and try to create something himself. Now, if you are familiar with skincare or cosmetics, then you know that most of these cosmetics and skincare formulations are created by chemists, not physicists. So chemists and physicists have different lanes. They study different things and they understand different aspects of science in the physical world. Chemists, to reduce it to very, very simple layman's terms, study chemicals, chemical reactions, combustion, effects, stuff like that. Physicists study energy and light and sound and how that affects mass and matter and things like that. Of course, there's always gonna be overlap. Physicists have to know chemistry, chemists have to know physics, but in his day-to-day -day life, he was a physicist. So he wasn't doing things like a traditional chemist would in formulating of the cosmetics. So as a physicist, Max understood the effects of sound and energy and temperature and light on physical matter in a way that chemists just traditionally would not. In addition to all of that, Max also lived in San Diego, basically on the coast, and he was very fascinated with the ocean and aquatic life. In his formulation of La Mer, which took him 12 years to perfect, he was very inspired by a particular category or a particular variety of sea kelp or sea algae called Macrocystis periphia. But this particular kelp is a sea kelp that grows two to three feet per day. They grow in one summer or one season from a microscopic organism that you can't even perceive with a naked eye to over a hundred feet tall in these huge forests that are thriving ecosystems. Fish eat off of them, they thrive, things are all living in there, everything's good, everything's cool. So Max was really inspired by this particular sea kelp and he wanted to incorporate it into the cream in order to maybe try and heal his burns. But he didn't stop there because a lot of these influencers and gurus and some doctors, they'll tell you any old sea kelp is just as good as La Mer because you just chop up the sea kelp and put it on the, in the face cream. But that is not how Max Huber did it. He started with that sea kelp, AKA algae extract, and he put it through a variety of chemical and physical processes that further treated it and made it more potent as an ingredient. And he called that particular ingredient miracle broth. It's trademarked, maybe it's a gimmick, maybe it isn't, but it wasn't just chopped up sea kelp put into a moisturizer. He put it through a bunch of processes. And from what we could tell, it worked. And when he died, he didn't have them burns on his face. So I don't know. I mean, take it, you know, with a grain of salt. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. But that's the story. That's the folklore. So along the way of inventing his miracle broth, he put it through a variety of different extraction and treatment processes. Some of them even I think are patented. It, one of those processes in particular is called fermentation. Now again, he started doing all of this back in the 70s. Today, it's nothing at all to hear that a skincare or a cosmetic ingredient is fermented or has fermented ingredients in it, but this is back in the day. Like he understood that fermentation makes a difference. Probably he understood way more than that, but we can just deduce from what he was doing that he knew it was important for some reason. So in fact, the first trademarks filed on creme de la mer were all the way back in 1981. And Max actually filed under two categories, cosmetics, like we've been talking about, but also pharmaceuticals. He patented it or attempted to, he filed the patent under pharmaceutical treatment. So this is where it starts to get a little weird. The methods that Max was using were a bit unconventional. As I already mentioned, Max was using his education and perspective as a physicist who understood light and sound and energy in the formulation and the preparation of the broth, which he would put into the cream. But if you look on YouTube, the people who have bothered to discuss that there's even a difference at all between La Mer and Nivea, who even bothered to discuss the algae, and who even bothered to discuss how the process works, Cassandra Bankson, looking at you, girl. All these people I'm mentioning are people I really trust and like watched. It's almost 
almost like a betrayal when I realized they didn't get the full story. They didn't tell me the full truth. You know what I mean? But like, we'll put a we'll put a clip from her video here. It's like the insane reason La Mer charges five hundred dollars for their moisturizer, and she's talking about the fermentation process and the and the treatment process of the Miracle Broth as if it's some type of voodoo. The products are exposed to gurgling noises and light flashes. Yeah, I'm not joking. He used physics to actually create a miracle treatment for his products. He claimed gave them magical healing properties. He wasn't flashing these lights or sounds directly onto a living organism or a human. He was treating jars of skincare, these creams, with this light and sound and claiming that it was somehow endowing them with these unparalleled properties. This brand goes so deep you don't even understand. The physicist who's dead literally uses sound waves and sang to his cosmetics and told people to eat them. Why do people spend $400 on this stuff? I ain't trying to say voodoo don't work too because I'm from Louisiana and I've seen some stuff, but you really don't want to make the voodoo people mad. I come in peace, voodoo practitioners, truly. I know it's real, just leave me out of it. But the way that they talk about it on the internet is that as if it's some type of like, ooh, like a spooky ghost story. And again, like I mentioned, you know, there's people in the comment section. They refer to La Mer customers and proponents as all kind of names from gullible, naive, all the way to downright stupid. And the consensus seems to be among these experts and doctors across the internet, the treatment formulation process and the fermentation process and all of that for the miracle broth doesn't work and it's nothing more than a gimmick to try and make sales and maybe that's true or maybe it's not and I'm about to stop having to take people's word for stuff and looking into it myself that's why I got to make this video today so just as a side note Max the inventor of La Mer died in the early 90s, I think it was 1991. And when he died, he left the La Mer lab and all of the processes and everything to his daughter. Now he had worked with the daughter in the lab and shown her things of how to make La Mer and stuff, but he was more like a operating off of intuition type of scientist. He didn't keep a lot of notebooks. There's a few things written down here and there, but he really didn't keep a lot of it his ideas and thoughts written down. And so it was very difficult for the daughter to recreate La Mer. It was very difficult for her to create the effects that the original La Mer had had. But before Max had died, just a few years before he had died back in the 80s, Estee Lauder, a huge, you've heard of it, cosmetics company, got wind of this cream and they decided that they wanted to own it. And so they approached Max and wanted to buy the formula and the brand and everything from him. He was very concerned that a large company was gonna mess it up because they weren't gonna get it. And he refused. He declined to sell his company to Estee Lauder. So after Max told Estee Lauder no, Estee Lauder put a chemist in charge of duping. La Mer. And that chemist today, fast forward, he still works at Estee Lauder. He's like the president or vice president of research and development. Like he's been with them for like 40 years or something. But that guy, his name's Andrew Bivakwa. He's even done interviews since then about the process and about how it went when he tried to replicate the formula. He said he came pretty close to replicating it and he even got it to the point where it actually even smelled just like La Mer. But after years of trying, he ultimately failed. So he couldn't replicate the formula either. Well, fast forward, for a few years, Max passes away. His daughter does try to keep up the formula, keep up the production. She just can't figure it out. And she had remembered that Estee Lauder wanted to buy the company. So she called them up and she said, do y'all still want to buy the company? Because the brand is going to die if I'm in charge of it because I can't do it. So within a short time, they had that same guy, Andrew Baklava or whatever, on his way to Max's lab to meet up with the daughter. And what he saw when he showed up to that lab, which was in Max's garage, to make things even weirder. He was absolutely astounded. He said it was the most bizarre thing that he ever saw. The room was lined with little buckets of cream and there were weird sounds and odors and pulsing light being directed at the Miracle Bra. He said he spent two weeks with Max's daughter since she had stood by her father's side learning how to make the La Mer and she taught this guy, Andrew, at Estee Lauder, what her dad had taught her. There were literal fish tanks full of different color broth because it was at different stages of the fermentation process. They were full of sludge being blasted with different lights and sounds. There were tape recorders, like the big ones with the wheels turning, playing nonstop gurgling sounds at the sludge mixtures. And there were apparently thousands of recordings with annotations that Max had kept. To this day, La Mer still apparently uses the last recording that Max made the broth with. And the recording was supposed to be the sound 
sense of the sea that, that the kelp in its natural habitat would be hearing. Needless to say, Andrew over at Estee Lauder could never have guessed with his chemistry background that this is what Max had going on in that lab when he set out to duplicate Lemaire years earlier. So by 1995, four years after Max passed away, Estee Lauder had acquired Lemaire, the company, and the brand from Max's family, and they attempted as close as they could to stay true to Lemaire's original formulation processes. Now, this light and sound wave process is what has earned Lemaire and Huber the distinct honor of being called snake oil and snake oil salespeople. YouTubers and so-called experts and specialists have dragged Lemaire for, quote, singing to the moisturizer. Singing to the products, claiming that there is living seaweed inside of them, when in reality they get shipped across the country on hot trucks and sit on shelves for two years. They claim that the sounds and lights are nothing more than gimmicky marketing used to fool stupid rich people with more money than cents, and I honestly believed that too. Today, I would offer an alternative perspective for your consideration. Again, I am not saying these processes make it worth the money, not saying that. What I am saying is that we should reconsider whether these processes actually work or actually could be doing something other than just singing to the moisturizer, okay? Just think about it. First, let's talk about a field of physics known as cymatics. Cymatics is the study of wave phenomena, especially sound waves and their visual representation. Put another way, somatics is the study of the physical visual representation of a particular sound wave. Here, look at these clips. Here's a video, has 20 million views, showing a plate with salt on it, it's shaking around. Here's another one with something called ferro fluid and food coloring so that you can see that it's not just little particulate, but it's also semi-liquids that somatics have the same effect on. As you can see from that first video, the higher the pitch of the frequency of the sound wave, the more complex the geometric shapes and patterns will become on those plates. Sound waves can also be used to counteract gravity in a process known as acoustic levitation. Here's another video. Finally, sound waves, as y'all probably know, at the right volume, amplitude, frequency, etc., can rupture the human eardrum or the tympanic membrane. So sound waves can have and do have profound effects on physical matter, mass, whether it be particles like salt, little solids that act together in a group, or liquids, sort of quasi-liquids like ferrofluid, solids like an eardrum. Sound waves have profound effects in physics on physical matter. Lemaire is very secretive with their formulations, doesn't really share the particulars of the process, so I don't really have any way of measuring if what they're doing is effective or works. And even if I did know all their secrets, I'm obviously not a physicist, even though I play one on YouTube. Do physicists wear this outfit? Wait. I think it's a little bit irresponsible for influencers with science backgrounds, and especially doctors who do have to take at least some physics classes, to state conclusively that there's no way that the sound waves make a difference in the formulation of cosmetics. Dismissing something as snake oil sales just because you don't understand the process makes me as a consumer a lot less likely to trust your future conclusions. That's what I'll say. That's cymatic out of the way and acoustic levitation and sound waves. Now let's talk about fermentation. Fermentation is the chemical breakdown of a substance by bacteria or yeast, mostly it's usually gonna be yeast or other microorganisms even. And the fermentation process typically involves effervescence and the giving off of heat. What's effervescence, you're wondering? I'll tell you right now. Now it's time for our science experiment. The science guy. Ting. I know, I know, I'm gonna do that last. I'm trying to you piss off the pre-med students. Even with the <laughs> Surgery tech, this how you do it? My boy band hands. Okay, mostly I just wanted to have a Bill Nye the Science Guy moment. Oh, how could I do it without my eye protection? We're gonna demonstrate a little effervescence process for y'all. Got a little organic apple cider vinegar. Ew, it stinks. Some water, baking, it stinks. Ugh. Cannot be a scientist. Very precise measuring. Why don't you get all over the place? Ah! No! <laughs> Too much effervescence! It's Beep. Anyway, so that's effervescence. So 
In the process of fermentation, a living organism, yeast, bacteria, whatever, is breaking down a substance and creating a chemical reaction in the process. In that process, the yeast or the other microorganisms put off lots of waste products called enzymes that are actually beneficial in a lot of cases to your skin in a cosmetic formulation. Some of these benefits include, and I have a little video here, one of the experts, Actually, I still like this one. I don't feel like she ever lied to me yet. When ingredients are fermented, it greatly increases their potency. It just supercharges them. So all the good these things can do for our skin just becomes that much more powerful. The process of fermentation also breaks down particles more, making it gentler on the skin, easier to absorb, and better nourishing it. So essentially, this bioavailability means that it's easier for your skin to absorb and benefit from the fermented skincare ingredients. So all those YouTubers acting like any old sea kelp chopped up and put and smushed up on your skin is somehow the same thing as La Mer are also wrong, just from a scientific perspective. Like maybe it is good for your skin, but like based on this bioavailability, fermentation, amino acid, enzyme, antioxidant analysis, it's just not the same as rubbing kelp all over your face. And hell, I'm willing to even admit maybe it's better to not ferment it. I'm willing to go that far, but it's it's not the same. It's not the same thing. When I'm doing this, I'm imagining the Nivea here and the La Mer here. Okay, I'm just like a girl that watches these people and trusts them and believes them, which why? I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't. It's just disappointing and frustrating that I rely on these people and their expertise. They call themselves specialists. And listen, maybe there are some La Mer video. I didn't watch every one on the internet. Maybe some of the people out there did say the right things and all that, but I didn't see those videos. So I'll just put it that way. So a 2009 study looked at the effect of different wavelengths of light on traditional brewer's yeast in the production of beer. That's how beer is made. The alcohol from beer comes from the yeast fermenting. Scientists compared the effects of red light and blue light and no light on yeast fermentation. They found that this particular two-stage LED light process achieved a 36% improvement on the product yield when compared to the batch that had been fermented in the dark. So the effect on the yeast in the fermentation process really depended on the color of the light, the intensity intensity of the light and how long the yeast was exposed to each light in the fermentation process. So these studies done dozens of years, decades even, after Max Huber died, had verified that perhaps he was on to something. In the fermentation process, which is the whole heart and soul of the Le Mer cream, is that broth, which is fermented for up to three months, light and different colors of light could absolutely be having a very, very important effect on respiration rate of the microorganisms that he was using in the fermentation process, as well as the product yield, how much of those antioxidants and enzymes and things that the yeast or whatever the microorganism was, was secreting. Finally, let's get to that whole playing music for the moisturizer allegation. And I really, I'm, I, I say the best for last. I'm gonna sing my moisturizer a song tonight, but that's just my feelings. Let's get into the facts. Back in like the 1960s, a scientist named Cleve Baxter conducted an experiment that to this day remains groundbreaking and mind blowing. He was an early expert in the field of polygraph technology, which is like lie detector tests. And before y'all get into whether or not those are reliable, that's not the point. The point is what a polygraph detects is the electromagnetic output of a particular source. It doesn't necessarily tell you if you're telling the truth or not, but it does measure electromagnetic output of a whatever it is that the electrodes are hooked up to. A polygraph machine has several key components. First is the pneumograph, a device that measures a subject's breathing. There are two major variants of pneumograph. The first uses two sets of rubber tubes, one that circles the chest and one that circles the abdomen. These loops stretch when the subject breathes, thereby recording the rate of respiration. The second type of pneumograph uses electrical impedance to measure breathing, so the test administrator places two pairs of electrodes on either side of the chest. Finally, there's the Data Acquisition System, or DAS, which collects data from each of these subsystems and converts it into a readable form. A bunch of squiggly lines on a paper read. Polygraph interpretation is… well interpretation. No two people respond exactly the same to all stressors, and there's no hard line between pass and fail. Rather, administrators typically ask a series of irrelevant but uncomfortable questions to establish a baseline, and then they compare that to later more loaded questions about the actual subject of the investigation. So he was an early expert in that. This is like, what, 60s? 70, 80 years ago? They had color film 80 years ago. <laughs> 
he got the bright idea to hook up a polygraph to a plant, just a regular house plant. He wanted to measure what the output, electromagnetic frequencies, whatever, were coming out of this plant. So the electromagnetic output of the plant, according to Baxter, would read along the levels of boredom. If it would be hooked up to a human person, it would, it would read as they're bored or uninterested. So Baxter wanted to see if he could do an experiment to change the electromagnetic output, the polygraph, of the plant. So he thought, hmm, what are some things I could do to the plant to maybe stress it out or make it upset or make it extremely happy in order to change those frequencies when it's hooked up to the polygraph? The imagery of fire entered my mind and I not only thought, but I fully intended to burn the very leaf that was being tested with a match. Right at the split second, that that imagery of fire entered my mind. The tracing reflecting the changes in the plant just went right off the top of the page. He, he made a plan in his mind in that moment to set the plant on fire, just in his mind. He didn't say it out loud. He just thought that he was going to set the plant on fire. And all of a sudden, output from the plant started freaking out. The plant started freaking out because the man thought about setting it on fire and it was immediate. He didn't even have to light the fire next to the plant. He just thought about it. He just thought about the fire. He thought about lighting the plant on fire and it freaked out. So there was another researcher by the name of Masaru Emoto. He conducted experiments not on plants and with polygraph tests, but on water. And these experiments similarly seem to imply that music and even human thought can affect the molecular structure of water. Looking at you, Nivea, with your first ingredient, maybe they should be singing to the product. Maybe that would help. Mr. Emoto's work provides factual evidence the human vibrational energy, thoughts, words, ideas, and music affect the molecular structure of water. He would speak or think evil words and thoughts towards some water and put it in a little batch over there. And he would send like hateful feelings towards it. And then he spoke nice, kind words to the other water and sent that water like loving, happy feelings or whatever. Then he took water from each of those samples and put it under a microscope. And I'm just gonna put it in here what he found. The ones that he he put hate towards, that shit was messed up. The ones that he was loving towards and sent happy vibes towards and happy thoughts and happy music, they're all in these beautiful molecular structures that look like gorgeous little snowflakes. Honestly, it reminds me of the somatics. It reminds me of the plates with the ferrofluid and the salt on it. So the experiments not only showed that you could affect the molecular structure of water, but also that the water would hold on to that molecular structure for a while, for extended periods of time after the hateful thoughts and feelings were directed towards it or after the loving thoughts and feelings are directed towards it. I don't know if they're sending happy loving thoughts towards the miracle broth at Estee Lauder. I also don't know if Max Huber was maybe sending loving thoughts and feelings towards it. Maybe that's what those sound frequencies and things were. But what all of this experimentation demonstrates to me is that it is a little bit irresponsible for people because they just don't really know the science and it ain't new. Okay, yeah, the, the fermentation studies are from 2009, but girl, that's been a while. You probably weren't even making videos at that time, so it's been out. It's been out. And some of this stuff, the Baxter experiments are from the 60s. So it's like, why y'all didn't tell us that? Why y'all didn't tell us maybe that had something to do with the Le Maire formulation, miracle broth, etc. And, and maybe it is overpriced, but maybe if some of y'all got your head out your ass, is with your brand new skincare lines you're all making up and down every side of the internet. Maybe you should sing to your damn moisturizer. Maybe it'd be a little cheaper if you'd learned how to do it. And there was some competition out here, but instead of competition, y'all are just telling us it's snake oil sales. It's not snake oil, it's science. Now, are they playing the correct frequencies? Are they, are they putting the correct light frequencies, intensities, duration? I don't know. I bet you Max was doing it better than Estee Lauder. If I had to guess, I bet. But at least they're trying. At least they're giving it a shot. I don't see none of y'all giving it a shot. Y'all are making fun of it, singing music toward... Don't you sing music to your baby to calm it down? Music is a fundamental part of biology. Frequency, sound, light, waves, those are important proponents and components of living organisms, which is the algae extract is made up of microorganisms. There's all kinds of patents, specifically on marine ooze, algae extracts, uh, association of extracts of seaweed, specifically Macrocystis periphera, which is the algae that Max Huber was using um, and used in cosmetics 
products for the improvement of skin contours and the reduction of wrinkles. I just can't imagine a world where enormous companies and enormous scientific labs are putting patents on stuff that isn't doing anything. I really don't know. And in addition, I have been working on a little tub of the, you know, 0.5 ounce. For ting. This is how much I used. It, it, it works good. I mean, it's it's probably the best moisturizer I've ever used. Is is there one that's, you know, $12 at Walmart that maybe works just as good? I, yeah, maybe. I, I, I never tried it, but it really does be working. That's what I'll say. So we did end up going on a bit of a field trip. We'll put the footage from that somewhere in this video. I don't know. We did get end up going to get it. What I will say is it was not a very pleasant experience procuring the creme de la mer. Uh, first of all, we had to drive a very long way, like 45 minutes to the nearest la mer vendor. Okay, what store are we going in? Nordstrom, right? Yes. Wait, BJ, this is kind of a cute mall. Yeah, the Cherry Hill Mall, TN. So Jake called this Nordstrom about 45 minutes to an hour ago. And he was like, is this Nordstrom? And they were like, yeah. And he was like, do you guys have La Mer, creme de La Mer at the 0.5 ounce? <laughs> and they were like, let me transfer you. And then the Chanel counter picked up and Jake was like, is this Chanel or La Mer? And they were like, it's Chanel and La Mer. And I was like, oh, oh, we going real bougie. They were like, yes, we have it. Do you want us to put it on hold? And then they needed like a social security number. <laughs> Blood of the firstborn, like, I don't know what we're about to get into at this La Mer counter, but we're doing it for y'all. This is a step up from Macy's bathroom, I'll tell you that. Is it only men? Oh, this is your family bathroom. This is sexist. There's unisex and family. And it's vacant. Is it? Yep. Oh. Yeah, oh, I'm so sorry. That was me. <laughs> Starting off with the Let's get out of the section off. Oh, she's screaming. That was so funny. I'm about to leave the Nordstrom. Because you're the bathroom. My cortisol <laughs> levels are through the roof. The she screamed. We made eye contact. And then once we got there, the lady was acting like, oh. Yeah, it was <laughs> You're the one who called me that? We were like, yeah, girl. What do you, you see anybody? In the Nordstrom again. Hope we don't cross paths with that lady again. <laughs> So now we have to find the Chanel slash Le Mer booth. It's over there. Let's go. Okay. On the road, never know what's gonna happen with us. I mean, I, I have been poor free for about two weeks, I'll say. Am I gonna rush out and spend three or $400 on another thing of it? Like, probably not. To be honest, probably not. I have money like that. But if I did, I might. If I was Selena Gomez, girl, I would be using nothing but La Mer. I'll just put it that way. Oh, doesn't she have a skincare line? Maybe I wouldn't. Just kidding. So, I mean, the ultimate question, what everybody looks these videos up for, is it worth the money? Girl, I don't know. You tell me. I, I mean, it is it is a little bit preposterous that you have to pay $100 to even so much as basically test it out. Um, and Unless you have those Sephora.com points hoarded up like a dragon sitting on your goal. You can go on YouTube and find videos from any number of influencers and gurus and specialists and doctors. And they'll tell you it isn't worth it. Some of them will tell you it is. Some of them will say, I've used it for 20 years. It's the best thing. Nothing compares. You know, it's, it's really up to you to decide what your money is worth and what you want to spend it on. Most people are going to say no. Just off the bat. Even if it's the best moisturizer you've ever used, most people don't really, moisturizer ain't the biggest part of their life. They got other stuff they want to spend their money on. So that's fair. That's fine. But I think it's just not fair to say something isn't worth money and then use reasons that are not true. Use reasons that are true is my point. As far as La Mer's side of the story, which I guess I should mention, they claim that the process of making the miracle broth is very labor intensive, very time intensive, and that's the reason it costs so much money. They say in the cream, in the moisturizer, it's the first ingredient. It's a big part of the moisturizer. According to the brand, all the sea kelp is hand harvested in tiny little boats and shipped directly to the headquarters for only exclusive La Mer use. They also claim that the miracle broth takes three months to make. Apparently, they also add a tiny bit of the previous batch of Miracle Broth into the current batch. So each one is connected like that. And they play the original sound waves, for what it's worth, from Max Huber's lab to 
all the moisturizer. And I think that's even a little misleading. Oh, they play it to the moisturizer. They direct sound waves at the broth. It's not like like entertaining it. Maybe it is. Who knows? I don't know the collective consciousness of a yeast. Maybe they're entertained. I really don't know. But we've already established that certain intensities and wavelengths of light have a profound effect on the fermentation process. And we've already established that sound waves can and do have effects on the organization of the molecular structures and of the, I mean, at, and certain frequencies of the whole entire mass of an object. So, I mean, whatever. I, is it worth the money? I mean, you tell me. Let's just be honest about what it is. Also, um, just from like personal observation, like this packaging is elite. It is, it's like, does it make this worth $100? No, probably not. I don't think it costs $100 to make this. I don't think it probably even costs 50. I don't think it probably even costs 33, but maybe it does. I really don't know. I don't know how much seed kelp costs. And I know for a fact they're doing more than just chopping it up and sticking it in there. Like there's like microorgan, not cruelty free, tell you that. If you think that a yeast or microscopic uh, worm is an animal, then it ain't cruelty free. So I just tell y'all that right now. I just did all this research recently. Maybe the methods with the sound and the light waves that Lemaire is using don't actually work. That's possible. Maybe they work, but it's not enough to justify the price. Maybe it does work and it really just, it's just still too much. Maybe, I'm, I'm open to all of that. But the purpose of today's video was to kind of dig down into the allegations that there's no benefit to singing to the moisturizer or that anyone who thinks it works is a snake oil salesman or proponent. It's high time that we start using a little bit more nuance with these reviews and bald face allegations and assumptions, especially when the people espousing these views are touting themselves as specialists. It's ridiculous, especially, especially as we're approaching a time or have already arrived at a time where the only people whose opinion seems to matter are certain sects of experts and specialists. If y'all are the only people who are gonna be allowed to talk about stuff and have opinions on stuff, then y'all need to be saying the right things. That's all I'm gonna say about it. Same base ingredients as Nivea my ass. They of all people, of all people, the experts, the specialists, the self-proclaimed board certified dermatologists should be the ones making these videos, not me. I went to law school. In the meantime, facts ain't defamation. Love you, Mina K. Bye.